I'm Stephanie Singer, Arts and Ideas Program Manager at the JCCSF. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's a pleasure to welcome you to this evening's program with Scott Simon, host of Weekend Edition Saturday, and the author of Unforgettable, A Son, A Mother, and the Lessons of a Lifetime. I want to take a moment to give a special thanks to our community partner, Zen Hospice Project. <clears throat> They've brought over, uh, they brought over some information with them, and staff are here to tell you more about their work. So please take a moment after the program to uh, stop at their table in the atrium. Um, they've got lots of interesting stuff. I'd also like to take a moment to uh, thank Green Apple Books, our bookstore partner this evening. Scott will be signing Unforgettable right after the program ends in the atrium. And after you get your book signed, I recommend that you take a few minutes to meander through the installation, uh, ja Jacqueline Nichols, Time, Text, and Textiles, in the Katz Snyder Gallery on the second floor. Jacqueline is a London-based fine artist who uses art to explore and challenge traditional Jewish ideas in untraditional ways. Um, it's a beautiful and provocative installation, and uh, it fits nicely with the evening subject. Scott Simon, host of NPR's Week in Edition Saturday, is one of America's most admired writers and broadcasters. He's won numerous awards for his reporting, including an Emmy and a Peabody Award. When he began tweeting pain, love, and conversation from his mother's deathbed in an ICU in July 2013, he turned personal grief into collective emotion. Sharing painful moments and insights Simon broke ground in the uses of social media. He was alone with his mother for most of those days in the hospital, yet millions sat vigil with him, sobbing and laughing at the life and wisdom of 84-year-old Patricia Lyon Simon Newman. Now with his new book, Unforgettable, Scott unspools the story of his vivacious mother's life and of caring for her in the final moments. And finally, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that tonight marks the beginning of Yom HaShoah, or Holocaust Remembrance Day in the Jewish community. It's a time to publicly reflect on our legacies and inheritances and consider the memories we want to pass on to future generations, not unlike some of the themes in Scott's beautiful book. Ladies and gentlemen, Scott Simon. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's, uh, it's always good to be in San Francisco, and it's particularly good to be back here. Um, I, I begin with uh, a last regrets from my family, who've been with me out on a book tour for the past, uh, well, almost three weeks. Um, <clears throat> but uh, our daughters had to get back to school and, uh, and left this morning. But uh, thank you very much. Um, let me begin, if I could, with a section from the almost beginning of the book, which I think is of, um, strikes off something that uh, was just said. Begins with one of the tweets that I uh, posted from the intensive care unit next to my mother. Our children want to know if you're dead forever. I tell them yes, but I wonder about that too. Death makes life worthwhile. It gives each moment meaning. I hope I live to 150 and that our daughters can make it to at least 200. But death drives life. It frightens and inspires us. Do away with death and we'd have no reason to get out of bed or into it, grow, work, or love. Why would we do much of anything if we had the time for everything? It's the certainty of death that moves us to sing and write poems, find friends, and sail across oceans and skies. It's because we know that we don't have all the time in the world that we try to use the uncertain and unknowable time that we have to do something that endures. Death is sad, grim, unwelcome, and invaluable. It's why we try to make something of life. It's why we have children. You know, we were out here um, in Northern California, um, 
where we'd taken a house, my wife and our two daughters and I, and uh, my mother was going to join us um, when we got word that she was in the intensive care unit and I, I wound up uh, flying from San Francisco to, uh, to join her there in the hospital in Chicago. I didn't know that that place, when I flew out, I didn't know that that uh, would become the place uh, in which she would die. I spent the first night in the intensive care unit on the floor next to her on some pillows and blankets, and that wasn't very comfortable. So the next day, I determined that I was, uh, I was going to get one of those orange camping mats that you get. So I actually think well, here's a local reference here, the North Face. Isn't that a local company? Has a, yeah. North Face has a uh, beautiful store on North Michigan Avenue in Chicago, and I walked into it, and a young man came up to me, and he said, uh, can I help you? And I said, all I know about the outdoors is that I loathe them. <laughs> and I must say, without missing a beat, he said, well, then perhaps I can direct you to Bloomingdale, sir. <laughs> and I said, you, you know, you're much too funny to be working at an outdoor store. <laughs> and it, it being Chicago, he said, well, as a matter of fact, I do a little improv on the side. Uh, <clears throat> but in the days that followed that I spent in the intensive care unit with my mother, the hereafter was no longer hypothetical. As the days went on, it, it became increasingly real, uh, as did our talk about death, but more to the point, I think, life. Um, the hereafter became just the stop ahead uh, for my mother, uh, but God knows in time for all of us. A couple of weeks ago, some of you may have seen the piece that the New York Times asked me to do on, on tweeting and why they think I, I refuse to try and use the term, I, I, I try to refuse to use the term, uh, went viral. Um, the Times asked me to reflect on why they thought my tweets from, from um, my mother's bed in the intensive care unit took digital wings. And is that better? <laughs> only a little. You know, and I've only come up with a lot of not particularly satisfying half answers. It, it, it was certainly uh, a love story, love story between a mother and son, uh, a universal story of life, death, and love. and. We certainly in the news business overuse that term universal, but I think it, I think it certainly applies to, to life and death. Um, I also think that our social media platforms, Twitter, but not just Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and whatever's next, have become kind of our papyrus scrolls in this century, where we pass on scraps of our lives to be read um, or ignored or forgotten and discovered later, like, like the young man who... Uh, has been chosen to succeed. John Stewart and The Daily Show is learning. But I think the strongest reason was my mother. She was just so funny and interesting. There are students at a middle school in Valenzuela City, the Philippines, who read some of my tweets and picked out some of my mother's favorite lines and wrote essays about them. Uh, a couple of those tweets. My mother in ICU sees Kate and Will holding baby in tears. Every baby boy is a little king to his parents. At one point, she was struggling for sleep amidst the pain. I tweeted, listening to La Boheme now, Bocelli. Mother can't keep eyes closed. Maybe opera will help. I always slept when I went. <laughs> and one that's been passed around a lot that I take particular pleasure in reading here. <clears throat> I consider this a good sign. Mother says when the time comes, Obit headline should be three Jewish husbands, but no guilt. <laughs> um, the reviews for Unforgettable have been just wonderful, and I, I can't tell you, I can't tell you what it's like to <laughs> have a book with my mother's picture on the cover on the New York Times bestseller list. Um, by the way, that, that's not me. The, the, the actual 11-year-old me was far too unphotogenic, so they had to Photoshop some little male model in the middle of Australia. <laughs> Did a nice job, don't you think? Um, I, Carlos Lozado of the Washington Post wrote the first review uh, of Unforgettable. I'm not going to be immodest enough to quote from it, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to be um, uh, pompous enough to paraphrase it. Um, 
because a really good review can make not only the author, but sometimes especially the author, aware of certain themes that might be uh, in his or her book that, that we couldn't quite define but, but wind up knowing are there in the, in the execution of the book. He, he noticed that the book is also a remembrance of my mother's friends. In this case, it happened to be on the near north side of Chicago. Uh, they certainly could have just as easily been in San Francisco. We, in fact, spent a year of my childhood here. They were working women like my mother um, and men who, in the parlance that was still used in the 1960s and 70s, were sometimes called confirmed bachelors uh, or simply creative. Um, <laughs> they worked in clubs and shops and, and dated some nice guys and a lot of cads and or schlemiels or perhaps I can say here, schmucks, um, <clears throat> in the interest of clarity. <laughs> and losing her friends was just about the hardest part of growing old for my mother. Um, and not just for my mother, I'm sure. She said she used to cringe when she'd heard the phone ring because she felt it would be some uh, nice young voice on the other end saying, hi, Pat, I'm Betsy's niece, and I'm sorry to tell you. Let me read a section from the book, if I can, that um, it's about some of her friends and people who became very important to me. For years, my mother's constant running mate and gal pal was the woman we called Auntie Chris. She'd come to Chicago from a Greek family in Iowa, birth name Chrysula, and indeed possessed the kind of silhouette art teachers and gentlemen used to call classical. Her Aphrodite form helped her find work as a hostess and dancer in clubs along Rush Street when she first hit town, which is where she met my mother and, she said, bundles of big-toothed, tousle-haired Kennedy boys sitting with Chicago mobsters. By the way, I read this section the other night in Connecticut, and how nice there were a few members of the Kennedy family there. <laughs> and if and you're here tonight, because this is San Francisco, and I know they have a West Coast division. <laughs> uh, thank you for your contribution to our country. Chris was hard-headed and droll. She was an outspoken Iowa Republican who was suspicious of what she saw as the local Blarney guff and moonshine, and thought my mother, whom she loved, could be sweetly naive about men, business, and Democrats. Burn their bras, she'd exclaim, standing tall with Iowa Zoftig, why would these gals want to burn their bras? My bra is my best friend. <laughs> there was Melba, a media buyer for whom my mother worked as a secretary at an ad agency on Michigan Avenue. Melba gleamed. She was silvery, saucy, and the wit in my mother's circle whom we all waited to hear. One night, someone in the group came back from a drugstore with one of the first dental machines that spurts water through your gums. You filled a small tank. You can tell where this is going, can't you? you Filled a small tank, held up a wand, pressed a button, and a hard burst of water, and I dare say the correct word for that is spume, um, spurted from the nozzle. My mother and her friends filled the tank over and over. They giggled and gushed and dripped and gushed, dripped and uh, gushed and dripped, gushed and dripped. They aimed the spurts at each other like kids at a squirt gun fight, tittering, ooh, it likes you, <laughs> and ooh, it doesn't last very long. The laughter wound down after we'd filled the tank half a dozen times and saw numerous emissions. I think a couple of the women lit cigarettes. <laughs> Melba waited for the quiet to ask, and could you also use that on your teeth? <laughs> I had no idea what she meant. I knew Auntie Melba was hilarious. There was Auntie Abba, who was blonde, tall, slim, and walked like a samba, to recall a phrase at the time, as she balanced a Chicago phone book on her head, which she did many times for me and my friends. Auntie Abba may have been the first person I knew who spoke with a British accent. She was about as British as Dolly Parton. <laughs> Abba was from Baton Rouge and worked for her posh enunciation as assiduously as actors from the Royal Shakespeare Company now learn Bayou accents to play Americans. I won't have people up here. Just ask me about corn liquor and skinning alligators, she said. Auntie Abba trained playboy bunnies for clubs around the country. She taught the playboy way to smile, say hello, and deliver drinks with the bunny dip, the maneuver by which they could put a blue Hawaiian in front of a customer without revealing cleavage. Abba disdained, and when Abba dripped disdain, it was a powerful toxic stream 
The criticism Gloria Steinem had made of Playboy bunny costumes as being painful and demeaning. Uniforms, Abba corrected all, uniforms. And they wear some pretty painful and ridiculous costumes at the Metropolitan Opera, too. <laughs> Over the years, I think I've quoted Ani Abba more times than any presidential inaugural address I've ever covered. And I think she and Gloria Steinem would have liked each other. And by the way, the other night on the Upper West Side, I had the honor to sign a book for Gloria Steinem. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll find out what she thinks of Ani Abba. But. There was Auntie Marion, a former lounge singer who performed up and down Rush Street before marrying Charlie Grimm, the old Chicago Cubs first baseman and manager. Marion believed that cigarettes sweetened a voice, and she did a lot of sweetening. <laughs> for years, she carried a fluffy little white pom-pom of a poodle named Sugar in her purse. She wouldn't get home until after the last set and the last drink at two or three in the morning. This was not a good time to walk a dog who couldn't bite through a jelly donut. So Marion spread the Tribune over the kitchen floor of her studio apartment, a room she otherwise might see only to get fresh ice cubes for scotch, where Sugar could drop her sweet little fudgy sickles. <laughs> little Sugar would squat and quiver over the unfurled front page. Auntie Chris would shout, aim for Mayor Daly, aim for Mayor Daly. <laughs> Do you remember when we had to spring Chris and Marion from jail? My mother asked from her hospital bed. Highlight of my childhood, I told her. And, and it, it just cut short this explanation. They had been, uh, Marion and Chris had been out for a hamburger on Well Street in Chicago, turned, I guess, the wrong way, going down a one-way street. Turned out neither of them had their driver's license along. And Auntie Chris, when asked to produce her driver's license, instead of saying that she didn't have it, just said, is that what things are coming to in this town under Dick Daly? You need a license to run out for a hamburger? <laughs> I remember the tone of wonder and worry in my mother's voice when she heard this account and just said softly, Oh, Chris. What my mother said now was, they were lucky the police didn't drag him to Devil's Island. That night, we pulled on clothes as if we'd heard a fire alarm. We looked for bail money in the days before automated teller machines, and my mother plucked a stack of 20 she'd tucked under tissue paper in her lingerie door, drawer. We snagged a cab on North State Parkway, and I got to tell the driver, Chicago Avenue Police Station, please, and step on it. <laughs> Imagine what that's like for an 11-year-old boy. The station house was blindingly bright inside and crackled and squawked with police radios. A pretty mother with her son in tow drew stairs. Good morning, Captain, my mother told the desk sergeant, as if he were the captain of a cruise ship. We'd like to see a couple of your guests. <laughs> the desk sergeant didn't need to consult his blotter. A blue circle of officers surrounded Auntie's Chris and Marion, who were, somewhat to my disappointment, unshackled. Marion roosted on the edge of a desk. Someday he'll come along. She sang in a smoky, dusky voice, and he'll be big and strong. <laughs> this is inspired fair for a station house, as you can imagine. There was no arrest, no bail, just the mildest reminder from the police to stop at stop signs and carry your license when operating a motor vehicle. A kitten-haired young patrolman told Marion, well, sure, I'm a cop, but really, I want to be a singer. <laughs> she took his hand and brushed it with her lips. Follow your dream, darling, she told him. I sat on my mother's lap in the cab riding back north, Chris and Marion cackling beside us. The second sergeant we saw sure was handsome. Married, for sure. You checked his hand, don't you? The lieutenant was a better dresser. Officers get better uniforms, but believe me, said Auntie Chris, they all wind up wearing those funny little golf shirts and saggy slacks. My mother leaned behind my ear to tell me, I don't want you to think that jail is always this much fun. What I remember of that group of women from my boyhood is lingering impromptu evenings with lots of snorts and laughs, olives and cheddar cheese on rye crackers, the stroke of matches, the tinkle of ice, compact makeup mirrors folded with a snap, high heels under the coffee table, crinkled cocktail napkins with lipstick smudges, earrings pulled out and resting on a coaster, Tony Bennett on the turntable, an occasional crying jag in the orange glow of cigarettes, candles, and streetlights just below the windows. I don't remember, 
or more likely didn't recognize profound conversations. But I knew the buzz of laughs and gossip was a fizz that refilled my mother and her friends. Most of the women in her circle had been married at least once. A couple would be again. My mother thought one or two might have preferred women, but in those times, finding the right man was believed to be therapy for that. Single working women have children on their own today. My mother didn't think most of her friends would have wanted that. Instead, these tough, funny, and resilient women turned their care and tenderness on the child in front of them. They loved you so, my mother said now. I loved them. I was blessed. But my mother's friends, and my father for that matter, passed on to me a phrase for the kind of man they admired, a classy guy. The accolade had nothing to do with money, business, or breeding. Ernie Banks, who just left us, alas, he was Chicago Cub first baseman, and my school principal, Mort Reisman, were classy guys. So were Adley Stevenson, Nat King Cole, Sir Noel Coward, and the man who drove the number 36 bus down State Street. A classy guy had manners. He said, please and thank you, Mr. and Miss, and held open doors. Classy guys picked up checks. They left good tips. They dressed with respect. They kept their word. They sent flowers. They apologized personally. They tried to be kind and courteous, even if they sometimes had to be firm. And their best jokes were about themselves. My mother's friends had learned all of this by knowing a few classy guys and many who weren't. Mistakes, good times, lonely nights, and hard-won laughs had taught them what counted in a man's character. They passed what they learned on to me in dozens of stories. They gave me something to steer toward. My mother's circle of friends also gave me a glimpse of good friendship. Friends were the people you called at 3 a.m. to get you out of jail. But they were also the people who were with you at 9 p.m. on a slow Saturday night. Friends shared crisis, and they shared what was often the trickier test of tedium. My mother's humor and strength sometimes made it hard to see how much of her life had been busted. But her friendships with such rugged, chic, and appealing women gave her other lives to care about and gave hers purpose, shape, and laughter. My mother and I at, uh, at one point sat up for 48 hours straight in the ICU, and we talked a lot about her friends. Um, we talked about her three marriages. Um, I'll tell you parenthetically, when my mother had her first, um, this didn't make it into the book, my mother had her first cancer operation a number of years ago, and Robert Siegel, whose name you may know, my colleague and friend of long standing, called her in the hospital and he said, Pat, you sound great. I think you're going to live to have another three Jewish husbands. <laughs> and, and in the years that followed, my mother and I would be somewhere, and every now and then she'd lean over and say, Honey, tell them what Robert Siegel said. <laughs> um, <laughs> we talked about her love of art, because as a working girl on Rush Street, she had often ducked into the Art Institute between jobs. It was one of the first places in Chicago that had universal air conditioning. Um, she said she wandered in one day during the summer and you could walk from room to room or just sit and look and dream. It was like a vacation. There was Gauguin, there was Van Gogh. We're in San Francisco, there was Van Gogh. Um, <laughs> I, I, if I hadn't done that, first question would be, Scott, are you aware of the pronunciation of the Dutch artist? <laughs> She said, outside were buses and trains and police sirens, but inside there was Tahiti. There was a street in Paris. There was a ballet dancer in her dressing room rolling on her socks. Or was she taking them off? We talked about the group of people in the diner in Nighthawks. We talked about her old boyfriends, or a fraction of them at any rate. We talked about suicide. Um, my mother's mother had taken her life when she was 44. Um, my mother was 23. She said, it puts a fly in your head. You never quite get it out. And there are times, <clears throat> forgive me, I talk about in the book where, where my mother was tempted, and at least once where she gave in to that temptation when I was uh, an adolescent um, and came home in time to do something about it. But it is a testament to my mother's endurance and courage that she lived to the age of 84 and sucked every last second of life 
before she died. I, I have a section in the book where I talk about how my mother loved to entertain. Uh, and big parties were impossible in our one bedroom box, but she loved to bring a group of half a dozen people around a small round table we had uh, in, our, in our one room and set out white plates. And she would, she would entertain friends to thank them for trudging through snow to see me in a school play, uh, or to console a friend who had lost her job or her boyfriend, or, or to congratulate a friend who had lost her job or her boyfriend. <laughs> She loved to gather a group in front of the TV to eat, take out chow mein, and watch a world crisis, or the Wizard of Oz, the World Series, or the Miss America pageant. She brought up card tables from our storage locker to seat a, a dozen people for our, our Christmas Hanukkah dinners, because they got all mixed up together in our, in our mixed faith family. And, and she would plunk menorahs on the table among the little Virgin Mary votive lights that she would... <laughs> that she would get at Mexican markets, you know, and every now and then someone would say, Patty, those are, you know, not candles, they're religious symbols. And she would say, well, they make, they make the table look so pretty. Isn't that what the holidays are all about? Um, I have a section in the book where I describe what I think is, in many ways, her most accomplished and signature bit of entertaining. Um, and it was of a man, his name might be familiar to some of you here of a certain vintage. It was a man named Lar America First Daily. And do I see even a single nod? He ran for every office on the ballot. He was a Chicagoan, and every now and then he would get just enough votes, because his last name, after all, was Daly, uh, to feel encouraged. And he would get just enough publicity because he campaigned in a huge Uncle Sam hat, and often the full Uncle Sam regalia and um, get just enough votes to, you know, to encourage him. He became a national figure because he ran for president any number of times and actually won a, um, a Supreme Court uh, test of the equal, the FCC equal, uh, equal fairness, doc fairness doctrine of the FCC. And he actually got onto the Jack Parr show for the same amount of time that Richard Nixon and Jack Kennedy had in the 1960 elections. He, he was not considered a serious political leader. Um, <laughs> Some friends and I were putting out what we used to call an underground magazine, and, and we had sent, <laughs> I, I couldn't find a copy, but we sent what must have sounded like, what, which were very smug and officious letters to every candidate on the ballot, inviting them to meet with our editorial board to make their case for our, our hallowed editorial endorsement. <laughs> and I, I have to tell you, I mean, not even the, the prohibitionists and the vegetarians bit, but, um, <laughs> Bless him, Lar America First Daily called up and said he was coming over um, of an afternoon. We had to, of course, wait until school let out for the editorial board to meet with Lar Daily. Let me read that section. <clears throat> Lar Daily wore an old gray suit with elephant ear lapels for our meeting, but doffed his towering Uncle Sam hat to my mother when she opened the door. Ah, it sure is nice to enter hostile territory, he said, and see a pretty face. I forget what urgent questions we asked Lar Daly. He said a few crackpot things I can't recall and several that made our editorial board of sardonic youngsters roll our eyes. Public schools are a mess and the US government snoops on everybody. Things that make me wonder today why we sneered. Um, <laughs> Lar Daly brightened when my mother asked about his Uncle Sam hat. You just don't buy that in a costume shop, do you? She asked. I can tell from here the stitching is just exquisite. Good eye, ma'am. Got a Lithuanian lady works for me, sews it all by hand. I'll go through two or three of these a year. You see, I keep stuff here. He shook out papers at the bottom of his hat, kind of like my office, so I can keep both hands free to meet, young, to meet people. You know, Lincoln kept his office in his hat, too, when he was a young buck prairie lawyer. People laughed at him in those days, too, trying to be a lawyer. No education, that squeaky voice, those long legs growing out of his suits. Our editorial board had been in session for more than an hour, and Lar Daly, who did not otherwise invite comparison to Lincoln, um, picked up his hat and began to make goodbyes. I know you must have a campaign appearance to make, my mother told him, but please don't run off until we've at least given you a drink for your trouble. He did have one, scotch, rocks as I recall, and then one more for the road. My mother brought out peanuts and some kind of cheese with little toasts. You know, I run a bar stool company, he told us. Business is okay, but the glory days was back when I was young in the 30s. Bookies needed stools. You know why, Mrs. Steinman? My mother leaned forward. I was a child. 
They couldn't sit at desks and post the numbers on a blackboard, so they sat and stood on stools. The cops knew where all the betting partners were because they'd bust them. So I'd tell the cops, give me an address, you'll get 50 cents for each stool we sell. The cops would raid them every few weeks, remove the furniture, and the books would just reopen and buy more stools. <laughs> Kept business flowing, let me tell you. The second scotch in the reminisce seemed to make Lar Daly's eyes a little watery. But I guess the glory days are always when we're young. Right, Mrs. Simon? You are so right, Mr. Daly, she told him. I got six kids, he said between sips, all grown now. I know people make jokes about me. And I always worried about them getting hurt. Hey, your dad, that crazy guy in the Uncle Sam suit. Kids can be jerks. But I tell my kids, and Mrs. Simon, I'm going to tell your boy right here, you can't let a little razzing get you down. You got to do what you believe in. Hey, they all laughed at Christopher Columbus, didn't they? But he brought home the gold, didn't he? You were the soul of graciousness that day, I told my mother, with a man most people would have laughed down the stairs. He was a guest in our home, she said. I'm not sure I'd want him to be president or even dog catcher. <laughs> but he sure dedicated his life, didn't he? Well, you saw that, I told her. I was trying to be sophisticated, <clears throat> excuse me, sophisticated and cynical, like a journalist in the movies, and just saw the crackpot. You were gracious and found the human being. I'm, I'm, going, to, uh, I'm going to read forward to uh, another section, which I think I can chance reading at the Jewish Community Center, uh, because thoughtfully my children are, are now safely out of town. <laughs> I, I've read it in a couple of places and try and make certain they're not in the, in the room. They, <clears throat> they should be at this point, I think, over Ohio. So <clears throat> this was um, well, the entertaining you did, I told her. I figured out a few years ago why. Why not? It was fun. Well, it was just you and me. Dad wasn't around or dependable. But you enlarged our circle. You gave a kind of home to all the aunties and the uncles. They taught me stuff and enriched our lives. Well, you gave them something too, baby, my mother told me. It's hard to be alone like they were. Maybe some of that's changing. Do you remember High's little joke, I asked her? Well, he had so many. This one was really raw. Oh, that. Hi, I should explain, was a, was a man from the West Coast, in fact, although the other part of California, who had been a uh, boxer and then became a bra salesman. <laughs> I don't know if we'll, you know, ever see Floyd Mayweather or Manny Pacquiao wind up as a bra salesman, but it, it you know, made sense in those days. <clears> Hi, <throat> was a wonderful character. Hi, the, uh, the boxer who became the bra man, was a guest one night when my mother had six or eight people at the table and on the couch, and talked her into a story in the paper about an assistant coach in the Chicago Bears who had such an unruly appetite he'd run out of the team's training camp in rural Indiana to eat raw ears of corn. Raw, said Auntie Chris with contempt, utterly raw, can you imagine? And he's not some poor migrant worker, but a fat, well-fed coach. How can he discipline young men? Raw, she repeated, utterly raw. After a lot of yucks and oohs around the table, High piped up. Ah, all that corn silk, he said. He probably just thought he was eating a blonde. <laughs> Maybe, what a shame he didn't provide the punchline in Yiddish, but... Um, now stay with me, because it's going to get poignant now, okay? The living room roared and rocked with laughter. I felt my face flush as people looked to see if I understood what High had said. I was about 12 and didn't. <laughs> but to try to look wise, I joined the laughing until all my aunties and uncles began to lean across the table to kiss my forehead and rustle my hair. I realized in the wash of loving laughter that followed a foul, funny joke I didn't understand that my mother had made a pretty sweet place for me in the world. Um, I want to invite your questions. We're leaving time for that, and we certainly want to leave time uh, for you to purchase the odd book uh, and for me to sign it. We are, we are thankfully coming up on Mother's Day. Uh, although, why wait? Um, 
if you, if you file today and know you have a refund coming, what better way to <laughs> mark the occasion than a copy of Unforgettable? Um, I think I've already made the case with a naked appeal that it's a book that, you know, there's sex, adultery, life, death, love, a number of good naughty jokes in here. Uh, I also hope it's a book that, that at some point peels back the heart of love. My mother had a real life. Um, as I say, the pleasure it gives me to have a bestseller with her picture on the cover. My mother was not a Bush or a Kennedy uh, or a Windsor uh, or a Kardashian. Um, she wasn't a Hollywood star or a public intellectual or a corporate tycoon or a politician, but she was, as our friend Scott Turow, the great uh, Chicago novelist who knew her pretty well, wrote, gorgeous and charming and relentlessly honest, a true star to the very end. My mother had a grand memory for, for jokes and for old movies. At one point, we, we told jokes to each other in the ICU. We replayed in our minds some of our favorite scenes for old movies. My, my, my mother had a theory that Elsa really, really uh, was not in love with Rick. I knew exactly what was happening, that she, you know, Victor Laszlo was, you know, as my, my mother used to say, well, I, you know, I knew a lot of guys like Rick, and, you know, and after a while, he would just, you know, he would begin to spend more time at the bar, and he'd probably go off to North Africa with Louie anyway, leaving Ilsa <laughs> high and dry. And she said, you know, honey, take a look at that movie. There's a look that Elsa shoots Rick just before, and I, I invite you to go back. I think she's right. Um, and she had a wonderful memory for family stories. But as we went through her life, um, from the time she was a little girl to the time she was 84, from her life as a little girl, as a young showgirl, as a mother, and then as a grandmother, I began to think that her greatest gift was a gift to be able to forget. Um, she forgot old slights and hurts and insults and outrages. She tried to leave behind a lot of tragedies and hurts and mistakes. She was the only child of parents who often couldn't be bothered with her. Um, she loved and married a man, my father, a talented, wonderful, funny man, a comic, um, who drank himself into a nosedive. She lost a daughter. Her mother took her life when she needed her most. She had to take her son, me, and jump out of her marriage before her husband could make them all crash. And then years later, she married a, a wonderful man named Ralph Newman uh, in Chicago. They were together for 25 years, but then Ralph was, uh, was convicted of a federal crime, which certainly affected um, the life that they had planned. My mother's heart was shaken and broken a thousand times. I think she often felt lonely and abandoned, and I know she looked over the edge. I think a lot of people you would have used almost any one of those things that happened to my mother and used them as an excuse to immobilize their lives, to paralyze themselves, to say, I can't get over this. What am I going to do? I have to spend the rest of my life in therapy. My mother didn't do that. She believed in therapy. She kept going. My mother kept moving. My mother got up every day and tried to find joy in this world. She lived through a lot, and she left a lot behind. Um, I'm going to violate all kinds of uh, bromides of the business to just read, I think it's the last words of the book, because it seems to me that in the end, I felt after that time with my mother, people would say to me, well, how do you, you know, how do you summarize, how do you summarize a life in a tweet? How do you summarize a life in a book? Um, glad Isaiah didn't take that point of view. In the end, I think, I think we, we got my mother's, the meaning of my mother's life down to a few, a few good phrases. Write thank you notes, tip well, sing, drink responsibly. Remember that good manners cost nothing and open doors. Reach out to someone who is lonely, make them laugh, help people smile. Thank you. And we have 
we have we have microphones, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, we so do. Please Can let me invite questions? your questions. Question over here on the right. May, may I, Merle? That's you, right? People have said your mother had a hell of a. May I, this is a, this is an unusual relationship. It's so wonderful to see you. A wonderful woman named Merle Becker. That's little the the. the that's still the, uh, the name you use professionally, and her husband are here. No, that's not your husband. Why, who the hell is that man? I've met your husband Monday. This is my wife. Oh, if you want to keep, if you want to keep your identity secret. Okay. Merle was my stepfather's parole officer. Huh. My, mother, my mother believed, uh, he wasn't paroled, or, but you, you made the, no. uh, you can uh, explain what you did. I, when he was convicted. When Ralph, who was a truly great man, um, and I met him with Pat, who was all that Scott describes. After you're found guilty of a federal crime at that time, you see a, what's called a probation and parole officer, you found guilty. And then I had the responsibility of writing an extensive report about his life, his character, and as Scott knows, there was a lot of publicity about this case and a lot of pressure yeah. Uh, because it was part of the Watergate at the very, very end. R Ralph had, uh, had um, was he, convicted of backdating the deed. That it, exactly. Yeah. Of, um, and he had such an honorable life. He yeah. was a Lincoln scholar. And Pat and Ralph were just as genuine and open and kind and even though, of course, I had to be very impartial, which I was, fortunately, um, in talking with the judge, he was fined and did not get prison or um, uh, probation or anything like that. And I had never met Scott, but of course, when Pat talked about him, her face lit up. And this was in 1975. Yeah. So he was a name to me and on NPR, and when I heard he was coming here, and I subsequently saw Ralph and his mom in San Francisco. We had dinner together, and so I just met um, Scott yeah. the other night, and also being a Chicagoan, so he brings back so many my, memories. My mother used to tell me that you can meet the most wonderful people under the most unusual circumstances. <laughs> And you, I put this in the book. Do you remember what she said shortly after Ralph was convicted in the elevator? There was, I think I, I told this story the other night. Well, it's, it's in the book. We got onto the elevator after, you know, and we're crying and weeping. It was rough. And who should be in the elevator but I believe the man who was juror number five. And there is no etiquette book that can prepare you for what to say. And <clears throat> we, all of us in the elevator, including that man, I think, found the, the ceiling endlessly fascinating. <laughs> As I recall, the, like the, the courtroom in the courthouse was like an 18, 18th floor, 18th or 19th floor. Yes, so 18, yeah. 18, so we're looking up like that. And my mother turned to him and said, well, sir, at least we all get to go home and get some rest now, don't we? <laughs> One um, last thing, Scott, yeah. though, being here at the JCC, which I think is so cute. His mom, after the case was finished and I had left my job and... We were in touch. She was concerned that I was single. And, um, and actually, the lawyer who had come in from Washington was a very cute guy, and he was single. Bill Graham, yeah. yeah he He's still, still cute. Tell him, I, if you talk to him, tell him I, I remember him very well. <laughs> um, but uh, when they came to San Francisco and we had dinner together, I was newly married, finally, at 41, by the way, and they were thrilled that I had found this nice guy. So that was his mom. Yeah. Very special <laughs> woman. Uh, I wish I could tell you Bill Graham is desperately unhappy, but um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Forgive me for old. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, Mr. Scott, uh, excuse me, Mr. Simon. Whatever. Um, yeah. Yes. <laughs> your, your voice has provided me a lot of comfort over the years. And yet, um, 
seeing you in person, there's, there's this like disconnect there. There's some kind of strange feeling. And my, my question is, have you ever had that feeling where you, you heard someone's voice and then when you met them, there was like, oh, that's interesting. You know, I, mm, I guess I had, I'll, I'll add parenthetically, and this is a strange thing for NPR. You know, I'm on CBS Sunday Morning which is a show that has five million viewers. So there is no reason to have that reaction, sir. <laughs> um, I, I mean, you know, that, that's pretty well known, you know, not to mention, but, but I, um, I think the first time I met Bob Edwards, um, who had, if I may, long greasy blonde hair, and he was wearing like bicycle boots and uh, dungarees had just gotten off a coast to coast flight, and he said, hi. And I said, oh, you're not Bob Edwards. But in any event, he was, in fact, Bob Edwards. No, it had, my wife can become demonstrative about this. We were, my wife, Merle, was lucky enough to, and some of you here might have met her. My wife is French. And I was, I was making an appearance in Minneapolis a few years ago, uh, as I recall. And for the umpteenth time, someone came up, and my wife was there and said something like, you know, you don't look like you sound at all. Wait, they don't talk that way in Minneapolis. You don't, oh, you don't look like you don't sound at all. And my wife said, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> if I may, this is my husband. This is how he looks. That is how he sounds. He does not have one voice for the air and one voice for here. That is my husband. That is like sound. I think what you mean to say is that he does not look like the fantasy that you have had of him for many years. Well, <laughs> you, you cannot hold my husband responsible for that. And the nice man who was the author hauler stepped in and said, okay, thank you, Mrs. Simon. Come on over here and help us with the... Probably more of an answer than what you wanted. I'm sorry. Next question on this side. So it's fairly... It's, it's fairly... Um, it's amazing how much your, your mom influenced uh, the way that you behave as a journalist and you've behaved as a journalist throughout your life. Uh, you described that one moment with, uh, with Lars Daly um, and the difference between how, what you thought a journalist should be at that time mm -hmm. and then what you experienced your mom, how you experienced your mom acting. Um, was that a seminal moment or are there some seminal moments in your upbringing or in your life where you developed that signature approach of trying to understand the, the person behind what's going on as opposed to just reporting an event? <sighs> You know, maybe, but my mother always underscored <clears throat> for me, and I hope I took it seriously, that um, you're not just your job. You're, you know, I'm, and I'm, I'm not just a journalist. Uh, I'm sure some people would say I'm not even a journalist. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm, I'm a citizen. And there are... You know, I, the interview I did with Bill Cosby a few months ago got a lot of attention. And I, I had a job to do as a journalist, but that I don't think meant that I stopped being a human being. So I, I tried to, even in, in raising that difficult question that had to be asked, I hope I, I, I did it with some elemental respect, which is definitely, definitely my mother's influence. Nothing pleased her more. I remember once she was visiting and she brought in a rug uh, that she had had years before and had, had, had given to us, brought in a rug to a rug cleaner. There's actually a professional term for that, which I forget offhand. And uh, <clears throat> in any event, the man took it in and she, was give, she said, well, you know, I am going to go back to Chicago, so this will have to, you know, and you'll have to call my, his name is Scott Simon. And um, the man apparently said something like the Scott Simon, and she said, yes. And he said, uh, well, you know, he has such exquisite manners, and that can only come from you. And nothing pleased my mother more, you know, than to hear that. And I, and I have a, I mean, I have a, a section I describe in the book, which um, I had an old family friend, the Shulman family of Chicago. Some of you may have had Eli's of Chicago cheesecake. Uh, although I'm sure there's a local cheesecake that's quite good. It's, if it's not Eli's, it's not cheesecake. And 
Mark has taken the brand or the cheesecake recipe that his father just just put together at the deli on Oak Street in Chicago, and it's it's becoming you know they 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 did the Obama inaugural cheesecake and uh, lots of famous cheesecakes. He he came to the hospital. He has three wonderful daughters grown now. Uh, two of them worked in in the White House. One is at Condé Nast. Wonderful family. We're, we're obviously quite close. By the way, they have a cookbook coming out next year including a recipe, Simon Sisters Cheesecake, that our daughters have concocted the recipe. It contain, it's cheesecake with Nutella, raspberry jam, and white chocolate chips. And if you can have a piece of that and walk away, um, of course it's terrific. In any event, my mother didn't want to see anyone in the ICU, but, but Mark brought some cheesecake for the nurses. And she said, I have to see Mark. And they had a wonderful visit, and Mark left. And she said, you know, you worry about kids, and you worry about boys in particular so much, but you, Mark and I are the same age, you and Mark turned out just fine. And I said, you know, he's done amazing things with his father's cheesecake recipe. They're now even selling Eli's of Chicago cheesecake in New York. And my mother said, I don't mean any of that. I mean that you both have such beautiful families. That, that's what she believed in. What you, what you do for a living is important to fill your life with something meaningful, but in the end, it's not your character and shouldn't be. Sorry. Next question. Hi, I just want to say thank you for your wonderful essays on Saturday. Thank you. Uh, they are a highlight and just an inspiration to anyone who writes or listens. Uh, and I have a question about how your daughters reacted to their grandmother? Uh, was there communication, notes, uh, talking on a phone? There had to be more than tweets, even if they're in their generation. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. Well, our daughters are, our oldest is about to turn 12, and our youngest is, is eight, and they, they love their grand air. I mean, we, when, uh, when we'd come visit, uh, we'd stay right across the street, and uh, they would come over for these epical breakfasts. If, um, if they had looked at something cross-eyed, my mother would have it on the table for them. So these breakfasts, you know, oh my God, there was cantaloupe, there was several different kinds of cereal, there, was, there were two different kinds of hummus, there were English muffins, it was an astonishing breakfast. And, uh, you know, she, she loved our daughters a lot and vice versa. She was sort of the original Auntie Mame character. Um, and she would just take them away from us uh, <laughs> sometimes, you know. And they'd have they'd have tea at the Drake, which would be hot chocolate in their you know in their case. And um, took them. I can say this to the Jewish community: so it took them to see Santa Claus their first time. And uh, of course, because my my mother actually knew Santa Claus, as became became obvious. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, there, there was a, the night before my mother's first uh, cancer operation, we had, uh, we had dinner uh, at a restaurant uh, downtown or in the North Michigan Avenue area, and it, it was a, I mean, it was a rough dinner. My mother began, couldn't keep her dinner down at one point there at the table. And she said, I, I, I'm not afraid of dying, I just don't want to lose my dignity composed herself, I guess we all did, and we walked back. When my mother had been a working girl, there was a, as you may have heard, Chicago can have fierce winters. And she had, there was a route that she could take through some of the hotel lobbies and office buildings downtown to try and keep out of some of the blustery winds. And we took that route. She thought it would be something very nice to, to show. We just had the one daughter, then uh, Elise. And we went through the Drake Hotel. The Drake Hotel is, still sits there at the corner of North Michigan Avenue. Uh, people refer to it as faded, but it's where the royal family used to stay in Chicago when they came to visit Grand Old Place. And uh, they had apparently a, a splendid ladies' room. And my mother had talked about the fact that often when she had to change from one job to another, she would nip into the uh, to the ladies' room at the Drake Hotel. Now, the Drake was where a lot of Irish immigrants had worked, including her mother, my grandmother, who was the maitre d'est at the Cape Cod Room. And so the Drake had that kind of significance. The royal family stayed there, and the Irish folks were, were working there. 
And of course, they would have to use a separate entrance when you're an employee, so it gave my mother particular pleasure to come in through the front lobby and use the ladies' room. So she brought, she said, I want to show Elise the ladies' room here. So my mother's third husband and I sat outside wondering what the hell was going on, and they were in there for like 10 or 15 minutes, and, and when they came out, my wife was blinking back tears. And I said, what went on in there? And she said that uh, now our daughters are, were born in China. They, they are immigrants themselves. They uh, came from orphanages in China. And the, my wife said that my mother had rubbed the little powders and creams and ointments into Elise's little hands and face and all that sort of thing. And apparently said to her, you know, on what was on her mind might have been just about the last night of her life. And this is why my wife is crying. She said to our daughter, honey, never, never be afraid to go into a classy place. Remember, you deserve it. And my mother said to me in the ICU, you know, I, I said, what did you want to say to her? And she said, well, you know, I, I didn't know if I, would, if I would live to bring her to see the Art Institute. Or we actually wound up taking a cruise together where she showed her a lot in, in Italy and Sicily. But she said, I didn't know. And so I thought the most splendid looking place I could take her was the ladies room of the Drake Hotel. <laughs> she said, I wanted her to know. I wanted, you know, this kid who began life in an orphanage. Never be afraid to go into a classy place. You deserve it. I'm sorry. Question, question no, over sorry. here in the center. You think I've talked about this enough, but no. Yeah. <laughs> I don't mean, I mean just a, this reaction, I'm sorry. Yeah. You know, it, it, thanks to my wife, I come armed with this, forgive me. Uh, uh, forgive. Yes, sorry. So, without a doubt, NPR is my favorite source for news and information, and my number one show is Saturday morning when Thank you're on you. it. I, I love it. Especially the parts when you talk about your family in the essays, and when you mm -hmm. talk about the Chicago Cubs. <laughs> <laughs> Not exactly my family, but yes, thank you. Yeah. But I can tell you've got a real tender spot for the Cubs, no matter. Oh, I could show you where the tender spot is. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Forgive me. But my question goes back to, I listened to uh, Monday morning when you were on the Michael Krasny show yeah. on KQED, and you talked about, um, and you may have to correct me here a little bit, you talked about that um, we never really become adults, I believe, until our parents die and we have to yeah. face that. We're, well, we don't become fully grown up until our parents yes. leave us, yeah. But as I was listening to that, I was thinking, at least for myself and I think for my wife too, it probably happened a little bit earlier when we had to take responsibility for our parents, that the roles of the parent and the child switched yeah. as our parents were dying and they needed our help to take care of them. And I was just kind of interested about your comments on that. Uh, I'm sure that's true, and maybe I should adjust what I say to fit that, but I just didn't have that sensation. I mean, there were small ways in which we tried to take care of our mother, but uh, my mother, but she, you know, she was living independently. She was married to a man who just turned 90 on March 5th, God bless. Uh, uh, there was a, in a rehab center at the moment, and we had said to her over the years on any number of occasions, we had said, you know, we can get you an apartment in our building. And uh, she didn't want to do that, I think, for a lot of different reasons. But, you know, you know one of them was she, she wasn't ready to be, she loved being grammaire. My wife being French is what our children called her. But I think she just didn't want to be a granny. She didn't want to build her life around, you know, waiting for four o'clock and the little fingers knocking on the door to come in for cocoa and cookies, although she loved making them cocoa and cookies. Um, so, I, I, you know, that, that part I just didn't have. One thing I noticed, and I'm eager to tell this to people, uh, we would get my mother iPhones and a laptop at one point, and, um, you know, and, and, and she needed some lessons in it, and the people at, if I can mention another local brand at Apple, uh, are wonderful about having appointments. You can come in and see them. And we would go into, my mother at one point became so frustrated with her iPhone. She said, I, I, I want a phone. You know, I, this thing just blinks at me. It asks for passwords like I'm a British spy. It's, you know, I, I 
why would you get a, you know, why would you get a phone to take pictures? Why would you get a phone to get email? I just, I want a phone. Um, and, uh, yes, right. And we would, we would go to the Apple store, in which, our, you know, our, I'm afraid our children have grown up going to Apple stores, um, which are thought, you know, thoughtfully have the little places where kids can sit and play games and, and scour the internet and all that sort of thing. So in any event, we would go over to this, the very nice Apple store on North Michigan Avenue and we would begin to talk to one of the people wearing a Genius t-shirt. And we would notice in the course of the conversation, the Genius would stop talking to my mother and begin to talk to me and my wife. As if my mother were like one of our kids and we were buying her shoes. You know, the way you buy five-year-old shoes and the salesman looks at the parents and says, we'll see there's room for growth here in the toe. That's how they would be with my mother talking about the iPhone. They would look at us and say, well, this has so many megabirds, that sort of thing. And I just think that's reprehensible. I don't care if they are young geniuses. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, being with my mother may be aware of that experience, the way, the way senior citizens get talked past and, and disregarded and, and treated like children. You know, if they don't understand some technical term, people go, ah, oh, that's so funny, you're so cute. Uh, you know, because you don't understand what fill in the blank is. And, and I, I, that's a good lesson. I, I, and uh, we could do less of that in this country. We're going to take one more question back here, but I just wanted to remind everybody that uh, Scott is going to be signing immediately after in the atrium. So join us there. Up here on your left here. <laughs> Up on the stairs. Hi. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, uh, two things. Well, one is a comment, one is a question. My comment is um, everything I know about sports I learn on Saturday morning. <laughs> um, <laughs> Then you, you must know a lot about the Cubs, too. <laughs> well, you know, we, 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 because we have family out here in Northern California, and we do like the color orange, we, we begin to root for the Giants as soon as uh, the Cubs are out of competition. <laughs> and, A, that, that happens pretty early in the season, generally, and, it, you know, it makes for a much nicer summer. <laughs> uh, I was going to say, yes. lucky for us, that's a long conversation. Yeah. Um, and, um, but my question is, was there ever a time as you, when you were growing up that you were um, embarrassed by your mom and no. or as you were growing up, were you outright rebelled against her? I mean, yes to both. Uh, but looking, you know, looking back on it, I, 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 don't, I don't think, you know, as a kid and a jerky young kid, you, you choose to be embarrassed by your parents much as anything else. And, and I, although, I mean, I... Certainly embarrassed. Well, Merle, you were there the other night on Monday night. I came out on stage and my fly was undone, right? <laughs> and and it. Yeah. I turned around and my wife. My wife came up on stage and I turned around and my wife stood in front of me while I zipped myself up. There wasn't a podium like there was tonight, so I was sitting just on a chair. So there would have been, oh my word, and um, I. I think it's safe to say our children will remember that for the rest of <laughs> my life. In fact, if I had to say now, if there's a story that's going to, they're going to tell at my memorial service, it's, uh, it's that one. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, I had no cause to be embarrassed by my mother. I, at one point, I had been um, in Illinois, I had been elected state student council president. And my mother, exquisite manners, decided to, uh, to throw a party for some of the people who had helped me. And, you know, we were all tough, long-haired, case-hardened, cynical student radicals. And my mother had name cards <laughs> on the table. And, and my mother believed in name cards. My mother said, as by the way I do now, and to be on book tour, well, my mother believed in name cards because she said that way when people come over, they don't have to have this awkward conversation about who sits where, that sort of thing. And she said it also makes them know that you've been waiting for them, that, you know, you've been, you've, that they're expected, you've been waiting for them. So I noticed there were name cards, and I began to say, name cards, you can't, you know, name cards, they're, they're part of the old regime. Name cards is what we're rebelling against, you know, the people will not have name cards. And I, 
and my mother began to cry. And I really did love her, so I put her right, oh, I didn't have name cards, that's all right. And two of the first guests were George and Alfred, uh, who were members of the Black Panther Party. And George, by the way, is now a banker. Um, <laughs> And they came in, and I thought, oh, God, the name cards. And George, God bless him, said, oh, okay, I'm over here. Alfred, where's you know? They were totally fine with it. And, and all these, you know, hardened student radicals that I thought would not accept, you know, the table belongs to the people, um, <laughs> were absolutely fine with name cards. So <clears throat> as I look back on it, I had, I had no cause for that. I mean, I, I was... Merle, I was a nice kid, more or less, almost disappointingly so, right? But, you know, there were, there were times, I guess, when I rebelled, but not in, you know, not in any, uh, in any serious way. Um, not that I didn't cause her a lot of anxiety at, at one time or another, but, you know, a lot of that uh, was, was when I was older and I began to cover wars and range around the world and, and, and that sort of thing. But certainly, I mean, there were, you know, there were, I mean, that's part of growing up, isn't it? Uh, and uh, my mother had a genius for absolutely uh, understanding that. So did Ralph. Uh, it was uh, my father in, in really all the important ways. And so they were, uh, they were, they were, they were both utterly great about that. And I, um, <laughs> I, I, I'm sure my wife and I will be equally successful in understanding. Uh, our our 11-year-old is about to turn 12, and a wonderful young woman. They're both wonderful young women. And sometimes when people see how conspicuously my wife and I enjoy our daughters, for some reason they feel it's necessary to remind, oh, but you know, the teenage years. And I, I have already noticed that, that our daughters are tougher on their mother than they are on me, their father. So I like to say to my wife, oh, Darling, I really feel sorry for you. This is a, <laughs> this could be rough, but um, I, I think the one thing, and my mother and I talked about this uh, in the ICU. I think, and I, I understood my mother was different this way. I mean, my mother, I hope you'll find out in the book, could be enormously quotable, but she wasn't just all lip. Um, she, my mother used to say that you can talk yourself blue in the face. In the end, all that counts is your example. And I, th I think we have discovered that as parents, and I think my mother's life reminds my wife and I about, about that as parents. All, all a youngster really learns from is your, is your example, because the rest they will identify as counterfeit if you don't live up to what you say. And, and my mother was particularly eloquent in her example in her innate kindness to everybody, uh, her sense of humor with everybody, um, her openness to everybody. I mean, when I, met, when, I, uh, when I joined her in the intensive care unit, a new nurse would come on shift because she'd been there for a number of days at that point, and she would say, oh, honey, this is Mary. Mary is so wonderful. She lives on the southwest side. She went to St. Scholastica. <laughs> Uh, and we would talk, you know, we'd talk about parish, Catholic geography, we would call it. <clears throat> and, or this is Derek. Derek is from Poland. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can try and pronounce his name, but Derek, you say no one can, right? And Derek would say, oh, that's right. <laughs> People in Chicago cannot pronounce my name, and everybody in Chicago is Polish. And, uh, <laughs> and I said, even the president, Derek? And he said, oh, yes, if they trace it back far enough. <laughs> And he said, Washington and Jefferson, too. Um, and this is a conversation he'd had with my mother. And I, I mean, and she, she was kind of preparing the stage for Derek uh, and, and would not talk about herself. And, and my gosh, what a, you know, what, a, what a beautiful legacy that is for me to see when you talk about grace under pressure. Uh, here my mother was in, in what I think she certainly knew to be was going to be the last days of her life. And... Uh, and she was letting other people shine. That's what was important to her, and that, that's something I hope I take through the rest of my life. <clears throat>